Okay, I'm Peter Fromm. Welcome to this rather unique SAS Global Forum. Um, I'm an independent statistical consultant. Uh, I work for me. If you hire me, I'll work for you. But most of my clients are graduate students and researchers in the social, medical, and behavioral sciences. And I've been using SAS for a long time. And my co-author is Deanna Schreiber-Gregory, and you can see her info there. And she's been using SAS for about 10 years. So, okay, we'll have an introduction. I'll talk about quantile regression and quant reg, multiple adaptive regression splines and adaptive reg, transforming variable to trans reg, uh, then some general thoughts and the summary and contact info. Um, okay, so if you have a continuous dependent variable, the usual thing for regression is ordinary least squares. This was developed early and it's mathematically tractable. And it's used a lot because Alan Turing was born after Ronald Fisher. So Ronald Fisher developed a lot of this stuff uh, in the early 20th century, uh, and there were no computers. So you had to do stuff that you could do by hand. Um, and at that time, computer meant people who sat and did computations. And a little later, they were using the, what used to be called adding machines. But OLS makes some strong assumptions, principally that the... Uh, Residuals are normally in, uh, independent identically distributed with zero mean and constant standard deviation. And it also only examines the mean. And I don't think any of you would only examine the mean if you were looking at a continuous variable. Uh, at least look at the standard deviation. It is a range, it's a quartile range to a frequency distribution or a something or a uh, you know, density plot or something. And there are more recent methods that reduce the assumptions, provide additional insight, are nowadays reasonably fast and available, and I think they should be more widely used. So first, quantile regression. So in addition to reducing or really eliminating the need, the uh, assumptions about the residuals, um, there's three other motivations for quantile regression. The dependent variable might be bimodal or multimodal. When you have a dependent variable that's shaped like that, you usually don't want to use the mean or maybe not any measure of, stand of central tendency. Um, if you have a highly skewed dependent variable like income or sales or things like that, pretty much anything with money, also some other things, well, we always look at median income, right? well, almost always. You don't hear mean income talked about much. You hear median. So why do we model the mean if we're interested in the median? Or substantive interest might be in the quantiles. In the example I'm going to use in a little bit, we're talking about birth rate. Um, another example would be where I used to work. We did research into HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases, and we were very interested in the people who had a lot of sexual partners and not so interested in the people who had one or two in a year. Uh, or another example, if you own a retail business, you may have customers, and some of them may spend a great deal more than almost anybody else. You might be interested in what motivates them to come to your store rather than somebody else, and that might be different than the average customer. Okay, so now let's get into it. This is just a little bit of the syntax. This talk started as a, oh, it's had a lot of iterations. It was a 50-minute talk. It was a three-hour training. It was a 90-minute how, and now it's a 20-minute presentation. A lot of the details are in my uh, in the text. So one of the key differences from the usual syntax is on the model statement, you have a quantile option. And that number list can be any kind of list that SAS accepts, or you can use process. Process uses every possible quantile. So that's every distinct value of the dependent variable. That could be a lot. If you have a big, if you have a lot of uh, subjects or observations, and you have a, don't have a rounded dependent variable, that could be a lot. We're going to talk about graphics. I would say that graphics are always important in any kind of model evaluation, including regular regression. But in quantile regression, you often have many regressions. If you do, as I'm going to do, 10 regressions on the birth rate, then you'll have 10 times as much output. You need... Graphics, not just about assumptions, as in the usual models, but to summarize what you've got. 
So, birth weight. Doctors are interested in predicting low or sometimes high birth weight. Um, low birth weight babies are known to have all sorts of additional risks, and of course, high birth weight babies can cause problems in delivery and labor and so on. There's two usual approaches to this. One is OLS regression. This isn't good because different factors might be predicting the mean and the low quantiles, and what we want to predict is the low quantiles, and we'll see that is indeed the case in this in this case. What is often done is to categorize birth weight into low birth weight and normal, which sometimes very low birth weight, low birth weight, and normal, um, often at a cutoff of 2,500 grams. And I will tell doctors that this is treating a baby who's 2,499 grams as very different from one who's 2,501 grams, but is identical to one who's really, really tiny at 1,500 or 1,000 grams. And I think, does that make any medical sense? And they say no. And I say, well, there's a better method called this. It works. And they say, that's very interesting. Do it with logistic regression because that's how we always do it. Oh, well, I think doctors uh, make bad clients because, you know, we don't listen to them when they tell us what to do. So maybe they don't listen to us when we tell them what to do. So there's a data set in SAS called B-Weight, um, and it has a program with a reasonably full set uh, variables. So I'm going to start with just a very simple one, very a very simple model with only one variable, M weight gain. Okay, that's maternal weight gain, and it's centered um, on the mean. And we have quantiles from 0.05 to 0.95 by 0.05, and we're going to have a quant plot, which we'll see in a minute. When we do this, we get these two plots. What these are is the parameter estimates at every at all the different quantiles from 0.05 to 0.95. It says nicely smooths them for us. On the left, we have intercept. That's not very interesting. It goes up as the quantiles go up. No surprise. Bigger babies, higher intercept. However, on the left, on the right, we have the parameter estimate for maternal weight gain. And it's higher at the low end which means that while maternal weight, while women who gain more weight tend to have heavier babies at every quantile, the tendency is stronger at the lowest quantiles. And it's stronger, it's twice as much. Over on the extreme left, it's almost 15. On the right, it's about seven and a half. That's a big difference. Okay, there's another graph called the fit plot. It's a wonderful thing, but you can only do it for a single continuous IV. And here it is for this. So what we see here is from this model, these are the predicted values, okay, for each each line is a different quantile from 0.05 at the bottom to 0.95 at the top. Here we can see for the women who gained much less weight than average, um, 5% had babies under 2,000 grams and about 15%, that's the third line here, had babies under 2,500 grams. That's a lot. We can also see that the, the lines are not parallel. That is, the gap between the lowest quantile and the highest is bigger at the low levels of weight gain than at the high. Now, we can in make a much fuller model, including all these things, the child's sex, the mother's marital status, age uh, with a quadratic, education, all these things, and, and weight gain with a quadratic. And again, age and weight gain were centered on the means. So that gives us a bunch of plots. On the top left, we have intercept. Again, not very interesting. To the right, we have black mother. Black women have lighter babies than white women. Um, and the difference is greater at the low end. And it's actually fairly large. The low end, it's almost 300 grams. In a baby who's going to weigh 1,500 or 2,000 grams, that's a big difference. On the bottom left, married women versus un others, um, it was a slight difference. Married women had heavier babies, but the differences doesn't vary too much. You have baby boys are heavier than baby girls on the lower right. But that difference isn't very big, and it's actually smaller at the low end, which may be interesting to people. Um, 
Then we have stuff about prenatal visits. And we can see top left is first trimester, top right is last trimester, and the bottom left is no visits. And the, uh, the reference group is, I think, second trimester. So you have to be careful. Look at the axes. They're different. Um, mothers who didn't have any visits had much lighter babies than mothers who had a visit. And that difference was huge at the lowest quantile. It was 400 grams. That's gigantic. Bottom right, we have educational level. This made almost no difference. We got more educational level things on this slide, different levels of education. Um, smoking women on the bottom left had lighter babies, but uh, the difference was fairly constant. Number of cigarettes on the bottom right also made a bit of a difference. Then we get to age. Uh, the top two are age here. And older women had heavier uh, babies because um, these were all above zero. And this made a bigger difference at the high end. And it's about 10 grams per year. So that can be a somewhat large difference. But mother's age squared was negative. And we'll show, I'll show how to look at the quadratic effects in a little bit because these can be a little hard to decipher. In the bottom, we have preg pregnancy weight gain. And this is really hard to decipher because the not only are the numbers very different, but the shapes are completely different. So I came up, we'll see how I manage this in just a minute. Um, okay, so what I did, and again, all of the details are in the actual uh, paper, all the code and everything, get the predicted weights for different maternal weight gain, holding the other variables constant at their means. Subset this to get only the cases where the other values are at their mean, sort by the weight gain, and graph with a series plot. And if you don't know about series plots, they're an option on SGPlot. They're really cool. Um, what we get is this. So this is showing the effect of maternal weight gain on predicted birth weight, holding the other variables constant at their means or modes for the uh, modes for the uh, categorical variables. And some remarkable stuff is going on here. First, at the bottom, the bottom line, the first percentile is very non-linear. It's not even monotonic. And it's showing that at the lowest end, more than 5% of women had babies under two kilograms. It's also showing that the women who gained the most weight had uh, a fairly high percentage of low birth weight babies. If you look at the 10th percentile line, it's now more or less monotonic, but still 10% were clearly under 2,500 grams at the low end. And if we look at the top line, the 95th percentile, we see that at the high end, oh, 95% were of women at the very high end were having babies who weighed well over 5 kilograms. That's a very big baby, um, and that could clearly cause some problems. Um, so, and to summarize this, the extreme contours are where the quadratics matter. You couldn't find this with ordinary least squares, and this confirms mothers, uh, this confirms medical opinion. We did the same for age, and here there's nothing really very interesting. The percentiles are roughly evenly spread, and a little bit of a quadratic at the lowest end, but it didn't really matter that much. We can also look and see how accurate are the predictions. So from OLS on the left and quantile regression on the right, we have the predicted value. So at the top row, the fifth percentile, OLS predicted uh, that they would weigh about three kilograms. Uh, quant rate were predicted about two, about two and a half kilograms. And quant rate was off by 13 grams. That's not much. Whereas, um, OLS was off by half a kilogram, and the same at the high end in the opposite direction. And in the middle, the 50th percentile or the median, these were very similar. Okay. Next is Mars, multivariate adaptive regression splines with proc adaptive reg. So SAS has for a long time offered a few options for non-parametric regressions, including PPS spline, 
that only builds with low dimensions, low S, only low dimensions, and GAM, which has a long computation and isn't guaranteed to converge. Adaptive Reg implements Mars, which were developed by Jerome Friedman in the early 90s. And this is a prime example of computers having to catch up to methods because Mars involves a multiply nested loop with a very complicated mathematical function in the innermost loop. So until recently, this would work, but it took a very long time to run. You can view a Mars model as a generalization of a regression tree. Regression trees have some drawbacks. They're discontinuous. They, that is, the predicted value of the DV will jump at particular levels of independent variables, and this rarely makes sense. They don't fit a purely additive model, that is one where all us would work. They don't work, the, more, the trees don't work very well. They don't work well where there's no interactions or where one or two are very dominant. And you can see details of this in a paper by Friedman in 1991. Mars models are more useful in, most useful in high dimensional spaces, that have lots of variables, or where there's a literal substantive reason to assume linearity or a low-level polynomial fit. Now, in some places, there is strong reason to assume linearity. I would guess especially in chemistry or physics, there could be a strong reason to assume linearity, or you may have a very good reason for there to be a quadratic or something like that. I work in medicine, psychology, social sciences, behavioral sciences, things like that. And there's usually, first, there's usually a lot of variables, and there's usually not a lot of reason to assume that things are linear or even necessarily monotonic. So they allow very flexible fitting of the, of the relationship. Uh, there are selection methods that can reduce the dimension of the model by a lot, and SAS implementation of these I'm going to show it for a uh, continuous variable, but it covers the entire exponential family. So you can do these a fairly wide range of topics. There's some disadvantages. There's overfitting, um, but Friedman shows that this isn't as big of a problem with Mars models as you might think, and I'll show one way to look at it. And I guess the other one uh, is that the model itself the output, as we'll see in a few slides, is, um, to put it mildly, not intuitive. Unfamiliar options on the model statement. And again, like I said, this is abbreviated, but all of the stuff is in my paper. Additive, that specifies a model with no interactions. Alpha, that controls how many knots you have. And the knots, when you have a spline fit, you allow the curve to bend in all sorts of ways and it closes knots where that be different bends can happen. Um, keep allows you to force certain variables into the model. I think this is a very useful thing to have. Some, there are some variables that you want in the model regardless of whether they improve things or not. If your hypothesis is entirely about one IV, you want that IV in the model and you know, people say, look, this had a very small effect size. Um, max basis and max order. These control various options. The partition, which um, lets you divide things into training, test, and validation. And the score statement, which lets you apply it to new models, new data, sorry. So here I analyzed automobile data, which uh, are available from Kupel and Kai, which are people at SAS. And the data originally is from Asuncion and Mo Newman. These are, these are old data. So these, the models here aren't going to be interesting substantively. This is just to show how this works. Um, a few cars had three or five cylinders and they were strange. So I deleted them. I considered an additive model and a model with two-way interaction, but the two-way interaction didn't do only a tiny bit better, so I used the, the simpler model. All right, so here's the code. Um, proc, adaptive rig, model, and PG equals these various things. Output, I'm gonna send some output out, to the residuals and the predicted values. And I partitioned it into training and test, 
with test having 30%. Um, details equals basis gives output about the basis. Um, I don't cover that in this abbreviated talk, but it's in my paper and the other two I talked about. So we got R square of 0.91. That's very good. Uh, four variables were included. Um, first two were by far the most important. Year had four knots at these levels. Weight had two knots at these, at the levels you see. Acceleration had one knot and displacement had one knot. One thing here to bear in mind when you look at the graph I'm going to show, acceleration is sort of the opposite. It, it's sort of reverse coded because the way they looked at acceleration was a number of seconds to get to a certain speed. So higher numbers on acceleration are worse acceleration. Um, so I checked for overfitting. I had, as I said, used the partition statement. And then I looked at the absolute values of the residuals of the two models. I had data validate. I set these two. I create absolute values of the residuals, and I did a t-test. The mean absolute residual was 1.84 for training and 2.02 for test. That's pretty small. That was non-significant, and that's despite the fact that we have a pretty big end, 389. All right, so here's what I was talking about. This model, well, maybe John von Neumann could look at this and say, aha, but I can't. The intercept, 17.61, is pretty clear. But then we have a fra this uh, parameter estimate, 0 0.0057 times the max of 35,449 minus weight and zero. So if weight is more than 3449, this is zero. If it's less, it gets multiplied by 0 0.057 plus 0 0.9 times the max of year minus. And notice it can be the, the, the variable can be before the constant or after, uh, plus this times acceleration minus that. Uh, you know, this, I, I do not, get this. I don't understand it. Um, you could write it out because people sometimes want you to put down the model. So here it is written, but it's not intuitive. So what I did was I generated a data set that covered the entire range of the data on the independent variables that are in the model. Then I scored it using the score statement in, uh, in the in adaptive reg. And I sliced it on the less important variables. And then I made a contour graph. And the contour graph is this. So it's a little hard to see maybe, but these are divided. In the top left, we have the uh, MPG, where displacement is small and acceleration is small. So there's small engines that have good acceleration. And we have the different combinations here. And rather than get into any of the details of this, because like if these are old cars, it's not that interesting. What's interesting to me is that the shapes of these contours are by no means straight, and they're different in the different quadrants. So, you know, that could be interesting. Unfortunately here, the uh, Mars model didn't improve things that much but for the, for the ab average residual, but I think it's still interesting, and I think those graphs could be interesting to people in any particular field. Finally, transforming, oh, next, I think I have one more thing, transforming variables and transfer. Um, it used to be that we transformed a lot of variables in order to force them to fit the assumptions of ordinarily squares. You have box cox transformations and things like this. I'm generally opposed to that. And I see if you're gonna do a priori transformations, they should be based on substantive reasons. Like frequently you want to take the log of money variables because we think about money variables multiplicatively. If you're making $20,000 a year and you get a $5,000 a year raise, that's huge. If you're making $200,000 and you get a $5,000 a year raise, that's small. And if you make even more, it's even smaller. Um, same with prices of things. We don't. We say one house costs double what another costs. Um, so their log makes sense. But there's other times when you can do it, and sometimes you want to do it so the model fits better. You can do 
that is not that it makes the assumptions better, but so that the relationship is clearer. You can do many of these in data step, but Transreg offers many, many options and allows automation of a bunch of tests. And some transformations like splines are impossible to do in the data step. So there's a huge number of options in Transreg, and you can obviously read the SAS documentation. There's linear ones for linear transformations, monotone ones. That's very good for ordinal variables. And ordinal independent variables are often tricky. Sometimes people treat them as continuous, sometimes people treat them as categorical. If you use a monotone transformation, then you're treating it as ordinal. M splines, which are optimal monotone splines. Uh, op score is interesting. It's very good for nominal variables. It recodes things to their optimal level. So we'll see an example later, but usually, you know, each level of a categorical variable is simply compared to the reference level. And this lets you fix things a little better than that. So using the same mileage data, we have this. So we have model identity equal uh, MPG. I'm not transforming miles per gallon. I'm taking a spline of displacement, weight, and acceleration, op scores for origin, year, and cylinders, sending out the output, and that's what I just said. Uh, so displacement has a non-monotonic relationship with mileage. Let's look at the things. Here at the top left, we have miles per gallon. Well, I didn't transform it, so it's the same. Displacement, the relationship isn't monotonic. Okay, that's weird. Um, uh, acceleration has a slightly non-monotonic that matters more at higher levels, less acceleration. Um, let's see. Uh, acceleration has a non-monotonic thing going on there. And in the next one, we have origin. Okay, so here we have one, almost exactly two and three. Uh, those are American, European, and Japanese, I believe, or Asian. I'm not exact. I don't remember offhand. For year, it's almost monotonic. It's sort of linear. You might want to treat year as continuous. I treated it as categorical. Cylinders is weird. Uh, four and six were about the same, and six was lower than four, uh, which is strange. Eight was much higher. Um, but on this data set, the two models did almost the same. Some general thoughts. Uh, I'm going to skip those because I'm running out of time, but some, they're in my other papers. Uh, I just forgot to delete this outline slide. Sorry. Um, so a summary, ordinary least squares regression is often useful, but alternatives exist that make fewer assumptions and answer more questions. Uh, and these ought to be more widely used, and SAS makes them available in a straightforward manner. Model building is part art, part science, and part craft, um, but you want to play around with these things. You have more tools in your toolbox. Thank you. Here's my contact information, my website, and my co-author's contact info. And uh, thank you for attending this uh, virtual SAS Global Forum.